Welcome to the Rideshare Guy podcast, where you will learn about the rideshare and mobility industry straight from Harry Campbell, who's got over five years experience covering the industry and has talked to thousands of drivers. There's no better place to stay up to date, entertained, and educated. So let's dive in. Jonah Bliss serves as Vice President of New Media and Marketing at Comotion, a global platform where the most innovative transportation and technology companies, as well as civic and business leaders from across the mobility ecosystem, explore, collaborate, and interact to share ideas and make deals. Comotion hosts Comotion News, a bi-weekly webinar series called Comotion Live, Comotion LA, and streaming select content on a complimentary basis this June 30th and July 1st, Comotion Miami Live, which I'll be participating in. Uh, Jonah has had a lifelong commitment to advancing alternative transportation. I know he was actually with one of the original uh, mobility companies, which we may get into, and he helped patent and launched, uh, and this was when he launched the first peer-to-peer car sharing service. So he's run the marketing for an innovative direct-to-consumer e-bike brand, has advised ride-sharing platforms, and more. So he's someone who's really done it all, and I think that's one of the reasons why I enjoy talking to him so much. So Jonah, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Harry, and I always I love talking with you too because uh, it's just fun to chat about mobility. <laughs> yeah, and I don't know if you noticed, I started ad libbing your bio and then realized that you had already included your experience uh, with um, <laughs> uh, what was it early on? Get around, right? Turo, Turo, Turo. Uh, damn it, get around our, our mortal nemesis, <laughs> but close enough. Yeah, I knew it was fifty fifty, so I knew you're either going to be really happy with me or really mad, and uh, hopefully, I can make it up to you by the end of this podcast. I'm not keeping track. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I think, you know, I've been dating actually a lot of my podcasts lately. You know, we're recording here on Monday, June 15th, 2020, and this is going to go live next week uh, on Tuesday. The uh, I guess that would be the 23rd. Right. And, you know, I think for the reason a lot of things have been changing. I think not just you know, generally in the world around us, but also specifically in mobility and transportation and with COVID. So uh, really excited to have you on and kind of learn more about the Commotion Miami conference. But also, you know, I think you guys always do a very interesting job of, you know, touching on sort of major themes that are happening in the mobility world, but also probably I imagine right now, you know, very topical things, uh, you know, that are happening too. So why don't you start off by telling uh, me a little bit about the sort of, you know, maybe the major themes of Commotion Miami. You guys have this uh, conference coming up and uh, maybe we can start there. Yeah. And so I will say, you know, when we first started laying out this event uh, last year, you know, we were super excited about Miami, super excited about Latin America, which obviously Mm -hmm. sort of has a nexus in South Florida. Uh, (laughs) A lot has changed in the world since then. That might be an understatement. Um, But so now the, the event's kind of a hybrid of the two. So kind of starting with some of the previous components that we've preserved, you know, mm-hmm. looking at Latin American urbanism and, you know, kind of bus rapid transit, aerial gondolas and formal development. Um, Florida itself is really interesting as a leader in autonomous vehicles, yeah. um, in aerial mobility, aquatic mobility, you know, all, all sorts of interesting kind of various mm-hmm. ways to get around there in style. Um, yeah. But then... Oh, go ahead. No. Oh, and I was just going to ask you, what, what, what's your definition of urbanism? I, see, I hear this thrown around a lot, and I'm not sure I actually really understand what it means. So I'm curious to know, uh, what, what, do you, what does it mean to you? What does it mean to me? It's, it's a, I feel like it's a loaded question nowadays. Um, <laughs> but I mean, for me, it's, it's urbanism is about you know, creating more just, equitable, and functional cities. You know, mm, cities where not just can you get around them, but you know, everyone is entitled to that sort of mobility. Okay, so it's a good thing. <laughs> I'd like to hope so. <laughs> yeah, uh, but, but no, I, think I think you're. T- yeah, I was just so you're, you're touching on something super important that that mm-hmm. you know since then we've you know had to step back. You know, there's been a pandemic and then an economic mm-hmm. fallout, and now people marching for justice and equity and yeah, you know, sort of really important critical race issues on the street, and we would be remiss not to address those in the event too. So making sure we're talking about you know whose streets and how are they open to everyone. How do we get public transportation working for people again once they've been scared off because of the virus? How do we deal with the funding shortfall? So really critical questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's interesting because I've actually never been to Miami. So I guess on a personal level, I was very excited at first to go to Miami, the actual city. But what do you think makes, I mean, can you talk a little bit more about, you know, kind of why Commotion identified Miami as a great place to host a conference? And you mentioned a couple of the topics, but, uh, you know, it's really honestly, just frankly, a region I'm not that familiar with. I don't really know what's happening on, on the ground in Miami. I haven't researched it much and I've also never been there. So is there anything else you can share there? 
Yeah, um, I would say, yeah, well, for starters, I'm also sad that I, I won't be going there, but you know, rest <laughs> assured, we'll, we'll be back in 2021. Um, but you know, it's it's a really interesting place, right? It's, it's a fast growing city. It's got you know a very big sort of Hispanic Latin population, you know, very mm -hmm. pluralistic. Um, we've started to see things there that you really haven't seen anywhere else in the country for, you know, decades, if not centuries. So the bright line, this privately funded higher speed train connecting Miami with other cities in mm. uh, South Florida, where they've now sort of got the development components. So you can kind of step from one station to a hotel, an office, residential complex. Um, yeah, they've also been expanding their metro system and, and bus rapid transit corridors. Um, and then, yeah, they're a little bit more um, future looking, but, you know, they've been really big leaders, both on the public and private side with mm. autonomous vehicles. Right. Um, and, and just, yeah, trying to, yeah, I think they're kind of using like a all of the above approach to mobility, just, you know, try and test as many things as possible and, and come up with more solutions. So I think there's an interesting uh, Latin American connection too, right? I mean, that's one of the things that I always hear about Miami, probably Miami specifically, right? That it's sort of a gateway to Latin America. And do you think that's true? And why do, why do a lot of these mobility companies care about Latin America so much? Yeah, I think that's you know very much true, both in terms of you know sort of Americans of Hispanic descent. So you know whether that's Mayor Jimenez, you know the Miami-Dade mm -hmm. County Mayor, yeah. or other people in leadership positions there. But at the same time, you know people from Central and South America, they very much come to Miami to to do business, to to interchange both with one another, but also kind of try and work it up into the rest of North America, where there's I think unfortunately often the two sides don't speak as much as they should. And so this is kind of like a nice natural nexus for that. Yeah. Um, and so, so yeah, whether, whether it's, you know, improving bus rapid transit in Bogota mm -hmm. or you know, thinking about new finance mechanisms, it's, you know, there's just a lot to be learned. Yeah. Do you think there's a lot of learning happening both ways? You know, folks maybe in, you know, North America and Europe learning from Latin America and vice versa, or is it sort of more one way or the other? I guess the one um, way might be, you know, us telling them things, right? Because, <laughs> you know, the supposedly, you know, in North America and Europe, supposedly, you know, um, the ones who know what they're doing when it comes to mobility in some of these other areas. I'm sure you could yeah. argue that point. I, I would hope that this venue sort of serves as a, as a, you know, important moment for kind of two-way dialogue. Because, yeah, mm -hmm. you're, you're absolutely right. Like, Americans, we can be imperial about a lot of things. And often that includes just not learning or listening from our, our neighbors, let alone people uh, further across the globe. So I, I really do think there's a lot that we should learn and we just have to be willing to kind of, you know, let our guard down a little bit and admit like, oh yeah, maybe we don't have all the answers. And I think especially if you look at transportation patterns in the US, it's, it's pretty clear that there's a lot of things we haven't quite picked up yet. Yeah, and I will say, I think there's actually, you know, what, uh... I will say I don't study a ton of, you know, mobility operators in other countries, but whenever I get the chance to, I'm always really interested to learn about them because I think there is actually a lot of sort of two-way opportunities. And what I've found is that there's actually, you know, like I think a lot of it is just timing that certain, you know, mobility operators or, you know, certain dynamics happening in Latin America right now may not make sense in the U.S. right now, but maybe they made sense 20 years ago, or maybe they make sense in 20 years from now or five Five years from now and I think like the best example of that is sort of with China and all of the shared bikes and scooters that was a trend that actually developed there and then came to the US whereas rideshare was a trend that developed here and went worldwide so it really you know I, I think that um, you can kind of find this opportunity anywhere and that's why I think Comotion is such a great conference because it does bring this global uh, you know view on things so if you had to identify maybe two to three of the major themes of Comotion Miami and you know the conference itself well, what stands out in your mind? Um, major themes. God, there's there's so many themes this year. Uh, it's hard to pick favorites. Um, <laughs> but no, I, I mean, I think, yeah, for, for me, um, you know, learning from Latin America, that, that's sort of a, a big theme, sort of okay. cross-cultural interchange. And then the more recent, uh, you know, kind of things that we've infused into the program, whether it's you know, how do we how do we reboot our mobility systems after the pandemic and the kind of economic mm -hmm. crash? And then, of course, you know, how do we make our, our cities and our streets work for everyone equitably? Yeah. Uh, I think we'd be remiss not to, to touch on that. Uh, but, yeah. but to your last point about Latin America, yeah, I think you're 100 percent right. And, you know, there's so many companies, not just topics, but companies we can learn from. So you have Cabify for the rideshare audience. That's mm -hmm. that's another TNC that's 
very active in South America. And I think they were actually the first one to turn a profit. So I'm sure Uber and Lyft oh, would nice. learn to love a thing or two about that. Um, you know, South America also has a really advanced kind of like last mile logistics delivery scene. You know, Rappi hmm. is one of the companies. So, you know, scooters That's delivering right. everything. So hmm. in, in a way that there are definitely are fields where we're uh, the laggards. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, very, very cool too. So I think, uh, you know, one of the things that you mentioned sort of a theme and it sounds like obviously it was sort of a more recent theme because when you were planning the conference initially, we weren't thinking about how we would have to reboot the mobility system. And, you know, I think obviously everyone sort of understands what's happened in the past few months, but, uh, how, how's the conference approaching this rebooting of the mobility system? Um, no, that's, that's an important question. And, We've tried to assemble as many kind of both inside and outside experts as possible to share their expertise. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, Alice Bravo, who heads Miami Dade's transportation system, yeah. Salita Reynolds, uh, you know, locally here, head of LADOT. Definitely. Um, and then, yeah, you, know, you got the academics, you got the people from the private sector. So, you know, I, I think we're, we're still so fresh in the midst of this that I can't yeah. say here's what the silver bullet is, but I think <laughs> that's why we feel this is so critical right now yeah. is that we need to get these people in the same room, even though the room's virtual <laughs> yeah. and just well, have think... sharing ideas. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point, actually. Probably, I don't expect you or myself or really anyone right now to have the answers because, you know, I think you sort of, what's been interesting to me is you kind of have this whole pandemic side and that's like something that, you know, none of us were expert ep epidemiologists before this, right? Although probably some of us think we are now. And you also have how that, you know, the second order effects, how that affects the industry that you might care about, whether it's mobility or rideshare or delivery. And I think that that's sort of, you know, where I've been really interested, you know, something you and I have talked about is sort of the different safety of these different modes of transportation. Um, you know, I saw an article uh, shared by actually uh, David Zipper, who I think may, may be speaking and participating in this panel, and it was an op-ed um, from someone who was basically writing about the fact that, you know, now some of the data is actually pointing to the fact that maybe public transportation isn't so bad, um, you know, <laughs> in the times of COVID, uh, that, you know, some of these spreads may not have actually happened because of public transportation. And, you know, I think we're still learning a lot, but what, what do you look at, you know, when you look out across the various modes of public transportation, which one do you think has been most affected by COVID? Um, it's, I mean, it's interesting, you know, at least here in the U.S., uh, obviously New York was hardest hit both in terms of the actual pandemic, but you know, as the U.S. city with the, the biggest transit ridership, they also had like the, the largest decline, just sort of mathematically speaking. Mm. And I think a lot of yeah, the uh, America's fear of public transportation has been kind of solely driven by that. Like you, you see the one city with the most transit, That's you true. see this pandemic and, you know, again, we're not epidemiologists. We're just kind of connecting the dots here. So people freaked out. Yeah. Uh, but on the, the flip side, you know, countries like, you know, Japan and Taiwan with very advanced transportation systems have, uh, you know, effectively no deaths in months. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I lived in New York for a long time, took the subway you know, loved it, but couldn't say it was necessarily the cleanest operated subway <laughs> in the world. Um, yeah. So there could have been some, you know, particulars about that system. Um, but yeah, yeah. There, there was just data out of Japan and France showing no outbreak break correlated with ridership. Yeah. So let's let's get back on the bus. Yeah, no, and and that's sort of where I think, you know, I think that this article was sort of more criticizing um, people who, you know, jumped the gun and said, hey, public transportation is bad. But I actually felt that it was very reasonable early on, you know, for the reasons you alluded to is that, you know, when you think about early on, what did we know about the virus? We knew that, you know, it's, or maybe we didn't know, but what did we think about the virus? We thought that it was being transmitted in, you know, closed environments with lots of people. <laughs> all those things seemed bad and public transportation was exactly all the things that they sort of told you to avoid, right? The six feet of distance and uh, so I think it, it I think it was actually pretty reasonable that there was this fear of public transportation at the start now that there's more data coming out uh, I think it is important for people to you know when you get new data it's okay to change your mind what do you think public transportation can do to sort of shift that perception because I'll give you the perfect example we have I have a two-month-old um, in my house right now and we now have a nanny that comes and takes care of him and uh, she doesn't want to take the bus she doesn't have a car she doesn't want to take the bus so she asked if we could pay for her Ubers, for example. Um, so, you know, I think those are kind of the types of people, you know, she's not reading any of these studies and following it super closely in the news, but for whatever reason, you know, she feels that it's not that safe. Um, how, do you, how do you think public transportation can make a comeback? 
I, I think messaging is going to be critical. And, and I think mm -hmm. you touched on a great point. Um, so much of this, I think, stems from a messaging failure at the beginning, yeah. you know, born of good intentions. But, you know, we were getting, at least here in the U.S., messages from the CDC that like, oh, like masks aren't important. Yeah. And some of that <laughs> was to try and preserve masks for, you know, sort of critical workers right. uh, and acknowledging there was a shortage. But masks work. <laughs> we, we've yeah. seen that there's been one clear piece of data so far. So I'd say... Masks work, masks especially work if you're riding a, a train or a bus, you know, mm -hmm. put your mask on. And we've certainly seen most operators uh, saying that any patrons have to have one on. So hopefully that's enforced. Yeah. And I would like to hope that that makes people a little bit more comfortable. But yeah, I really think, you know, we need everyone kind of beating the drum to make it clear that, hey, if you have a mask on, you can get, you can get back on the train or bus. And honestly, if, if someone's riding a, an Uber or Lyft, they should probably still have a mask on there too. You know, it's... Yeah. No matter what, you're, you're kind of sharing a confined space. Um, so, yeah, masks well, I, on. <laughs> yeah, no, I know that was one thing that many drivers were concerned about early on is, you know, here we have the number one CDC recommendation is to stay, you know, six feet apart from someone. And as soon as someone gets into the car, they sort of violate that pretty quickly. So a lot of drivers were worried. And, you know, even right now, you know, we're starting to talk on, on the website and the YouTube channel about how rides are picking up and how drivers are making some money. And probably, you know, as you might imagine, the number one concern for drivers is, hey, I don't want to drive because I don't want to get sick. So definitely still kind of a valid and real concern for a lot of people out there. So I'm curious to know how, how that will play out. Um, so we've talked about Latin America. We talked about public transportation. You know, one other thing that I think you and I might share in common, an interest is in uh, this phenomenon or wave of slow streets and sort of, you know, the infrastructure changes that are happening around the country. And I think some cities like Oakland and maybe even San Francisco have done well here in LA. You know, they're starting to do slow streets. I applied. I was denied but apparently <laughs> for my street, but apparently it's because I didn't have a, a, a neighborhood organization, which I now, I think I have someone on board, so I'm gonna reapply, but what, what are your thoughts there? Have you been following uh, all of these sort of, you know, infrastructure changes that are happening because of COVID? Yeah, yeah, I've definitely been following it. Um, it definitely seems like it's something where we've been, <laughs> once again, kind of a laggard behind you know, parts of Europe that they've just rolled out, you know, dozens of miles of pedestrian spaces and bike lanes just sort of seemingly overnight. Obviously they had kind of a leg up of, Oh, you know, they already had sort of systems they could tap into where we had some pedestrianization and congestion charges, so it didn't feel quite as alien. Yeah. Um, but no, in the U.S., it's, I think like so many other things, the, the question's kind of tied up into these bigger questions of equity and race. Mm. Um, so to give a personal anecdote, a couple of weeks ago, I was at one of the um, demonstrations, you know, and we were marching in the street um, for, you know, racial justice. Um, and after going for a couple of miles, um, um, we left the rally just, yeah, you know, it, it, was, it was time for the next thing. Um, and by pure coincidence, you know, we, we turned off the, the route and, you know, people had taken to the streets, reclaimed it in the purest sense, just sort of people mm -hmm. power, stopping cars just with their bodies and, you know, <laughs> fighting for justice. Uh, and then we turned left and we were on a street that had like a nice little city of LA placard saying designated slow street, like, nice. please drive safely, you know, watch out for kids. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, this was kind of walking out there like a, a wealthy, uh, probably the whiter neighborhood. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, like who are these open streets for? Who are these safe streets for? If it just means that, you know, like a, a rich family can ride their bikes. I mean, great for them, but it doesn't really mean anything for the city as a whole. Yeah, that, that's a that's actually a good point because you know I'm here in mid city and you know the average prices you know I would say that you know if you looked at it like on a socioeconomic level right it's definitely a higher socioeconomic area um, and you know that's like this application process that I went through I guarantee is probably you know a lot more <laughs> you know it's happening a lot more in higher socioeconomic areas and I haven't driven all through L A but you know I've seen the slow streets in my area and you know Beverly Hills and kind of around basically some of the nicer parts of LA and it did make me think sort of you know that because there's this kind of opt-in application process I imagine that it um, you know opts out a lot of people who you know aren't willing to do it or don't know about it or you know who aren't going through that and uh, yeah, or I mean, language I, barriers yeah 
language barrier. So that was the one thing. I, I mean, it does seem like it would be, uh, I like the opt-in option, but I also like the idea of the city sort of, you know, because that's really when you think about it, you know, one of the things why I think city and, you know, the public, uh, people on the public side of things are so important is because one of their sort of core mandates and tenets is equity, right? They're the ones, like, you don't expect Uber and Lyft to think about, like, how do we serve everyone equally, even though they might talk about it? Um, I don't expect that from them, but I do expect that from the city. And so it seems like, uh, have you seen any interesting programs that sort of do it a little more equitably um, or examples? Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, how much the city is willing to invest in that outreach, mm -hmm. what neighborhoods have kind of stronger existing groups, whether in their neighborhood associations or block groups or even, right. you know, churches and civic organizations that they can tap into. Um, I, yeah, I wish off the top of my head I, I had like a great example um, mm -hmm. the, the only other thing I can think of, and I think to me that's kind of paints the picture again, is that, you know, if we think about, you know, maybe a month ago, the, the sort of the Coopers situation in Central Park uh, with, the, with the, the black man bird watching, getting the mm -hmm. cops yeah. threatened to be called on him. And this was in like a, a public space in the purest sense, right? The probably most famous park in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and if a person of color can't feel safe there where they're like literally, you know, millions of eyeballs, everyone's supposed to be allowed to use this space. And the white woman was the one breaking the rules. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he had to fear for his, his safety. You know, a much more liminal space, like a street where it's, you know, gonna be fewer eyes and the, the rules are less clear. Yeah, just putting some signs up, it's not gonna mean people are safe and have equitable access. Yeah. So how have you guys at uh, Commotion for Commotion Miami sort of thought about some of these issues and how best to incorporate it into the conference? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've really been trying to push that as much as we can. Um, you know, we've added some programming topics that are specifically about these things, mm -hmm. trying to make sure we have a, a really diverse panel of you know, speakers and panelists. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I think to me, it's, it's important not just to have say a, a dedicated panel or two where you talk about this, but making yeah. sure that kind of lens is being infused into the entirety of the programming. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, sort of speaking of the way that the team has had, you know, the commotion team has had to handle and pivot. This is something that I think, uh, you know, I, I sort of have to commend the team. I'm, I guess, technically, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm panelist. I think I'm still moderating a panel, unless <laughs> things have changed. But please show up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, I'm sort of honestly like a little bit on the outside. You know, I'm like very invested and bought into uh, the success of the conference. You know, and it's one, one that I really participate you know, enjoy participating in, but I know that a lot has happened behind the scenes. I don't know if you, you know, how much you want to go into detail, but I'm curious to know, you know, sort of from your perspective as someone who, you know, has probably lost some sleep here and there um, with everything that's happening, you know, globally, but also how it directly affects the conference. How have sort of, you know, the last few months directly affected the conference? I guess sort of starting with the fact that, you know, we had to, um, you know, I guess at first Co-Motion Miami was uh, postponed, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I probably have lost a little sleep. I think fortunately time seems to have lost all meaning during the pandemic. So that's true. <laughs> who knows when I'm awake and what day it is. Um, but no, I, I mean, I, I want to say for starters, you know, I'm and we as an organization are super grateful to our, our partners, both on the civic and private sector side. They've been very understanding, very cooperative. Yeah. Um, you know, so originally the event was going to be in early April. Uh, <laughs> the, the world changed a little bit a couple of weeks out of that. So we, yeah. we scheduled to late June. And, you know, I think everyone was honestly relieved because, you know, there had been a couple of weeks where, you know, the whole world didn't quite know the situation. And yeah. all people knew is they didn't really want to get on an airplane. Um, so when we told people that it was getting pushed back, they were you know, like, oh, great. Like, that, right. that sounds better. Um, and then, yeah, as the situation has kind of continued to evolve, um, yeah, I mean, certain states, yeah, maybe we could have a physical conference right now. I don't know if I would feel comfortable and certainly mm -hmm. few people would want to get on an airplane. So towards that end, yeah, we again kind of pivoted a little bit to make it a virtual event. Um, we've been doing basically since the pandemic started a bunch of smaller kind of one hour commotion live yeah. webinars that have been a great success. People have really shown an appetite for learning and uh, knowledge transfer and networking right now. It's kind of a, a chance for people to step back and, and, you know, kind of improve their, their skills. So doing an event like this, I think there's still tremendous appetite. I think in some ways doing it virtually has the advantage that, you know, someone can participate from anywhere. So it makes it even easier to bring in great speakers from South America, from Asia, from all over the world. You know, all they need is a microphone and an hour of their yeah. time versus a airplane ticket. Um, and then, point. 
On the, the flip side, and this is important for listeners out there, it also lets us really democratize the content. So a lot mm -hmm. of it's now going to be available on a complimentary basis. Uh, so if yeah. you just go to commotionmiami.com and, and sign up, you know, RSVP, save the date, uh, you can watch the stream too and, and learn from the best without having to worry about tickets. Hmm. So you're saying that it's actually free to attend this year? Much of it will be, yeah. But there's going to be a, a premium ticket with, with some extra perks that I, you know, would love people that are really passionate about the space to get. Mm -hmm. But if uh, you just want to know what's the future of ride sharing or delivery, or you know, you see a couple interesting sessions, just come and learn. Hmm. Very cool. Um, yeah, you know, I think that's definitely one thing that with, you know, I mean, any conference, right? Uh, you know, anyone who's been to a large conference can probably see that, you know, these conferences definitely have a lot going on, you know, and, you know, with uh, as far as everything from, you know, kind of like on the ground logistics to, um, you know, just like running and organizing a conference, basically to say they're not cheap to put on, right? So it's no surprise that, you know, these conferences usually have, you know, ticket prices or even sometimes high ticket prices. So I think that is, you know, I, I didn't really think about the fact that uh, it does allow you to democratize a lot of this content. I like the way, uh, you put that because I, I suspect there's a lot of people, you know, that may not be able to attend, you know, either for, you know, logistical reasons or, you know, financial reasons too, to be mm -hmm. frank. So th that's kind of cool. Um, are there any other pros or cons that you found in moving the event um, to virtual, just strictly from sort of the organizer's point of view? I'm curious to know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure my colleagues, you know, kind of running around behind the seats could point to a lot of cons, but. Uh... <laughs> No, well, I mean, I, th I think the pro you mentioned actually at the start was really interesting because, you know, I think the number one excuse probably for people not wanting to speak at a conference or not even attend, you know, is time. But if, you know, if all they have to do is hop on to an hour panel and, you know, get their message across, I think it's probably a lot harder for them to say no in, in a kind of a good way. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. It, it opens up the world of people that can easily opt in. That's mm -hmm. great. Um, I, you know, I think it gives us the opportunity to kind of experiment with interesting kind of interactive features. Um, mm. so whether it's polling or more video or things even a little more clever than that. Mm. Um, yeah, it's just, I mean, everything is so in flux right now that I think mm. it kind of gives us a moment to step back and think like, all right, what, what should a conference be? Like, what should yeah. a big gathering be? Like, it doesn't just have to be the same way it's been for a hundred years. Yeah. Well, and I know that I recorded a good recap of Commotion LA, which was back in December of 2019 with uh, Tom Morris. November, sorry. Um, I think we recorded it in December. So that's a uh, Rideshare Guy episode 112. If anyone wants to go back and listen to that, that was interesting. And I remember one of the things, you know, that, uh, you know, I enjoy the panels, but I'm definitely not at every single panel. I'm definitely at my own, but <laughs> I'm not at all of them. And I do, you know, kind of go to a lot of these conferences, you know, like many for the networking to meet with. Um, uh, I don't really meet with many clients, but I know a lot of people like to meet with potential clients or folks like that. But, you know, sort of the off-site activities, the dinners and things like that. Have you guys thought about the best ways to facilitate that? Or do you think it's just a lot more challenging with a online-only event? Um, I mean, there's, there's definitely going to be some of that. Yeah, we, we have mm -hmm. to be a little clever about it. But, uh, yeah. yeah, I think there's still going to be sort of like a, a virtual happy hour. So, oh, cool. you know, a, a chance to kind of kick back. Um yeah, I think it really just comes down to, you know, being clever about the tools that we can use and how we put them in front mm -hmm. of people and still, you know, curate those introductions and, and make yeah. it work for people. Um, so it's, I think in, in some ways there's going to be even more kind of um, unexpected interactions. You know, some some people at conferences, they're they're a little bit more the wallflower type. They're, yeah. They can be intimidated about going up to someone, but the barriers to entry are lower if it's just online and you don't have to worry about you know, looking imposing or, oh, this person's yeah. got a great suit on and I don't. Um, so, yeah, I think it's going to kind of, it's going to be fun. Yeah, I'm kind of imagining the early 90s uh, AOL chat rooms where you would kind of, you know, pop in there and, you know, what would you say? You'd ask people age, sex, location, you know, send them a <laughs> private message like, hey, how's it going? You know, in certain topics. <laughs> so I don't know. It's funny how some of these things may be full circle. And, you know, I, I definitely I've heard a couple interviews lately that it sounds like there are a lot of startups actually too working on cool sort of interactive Zoom products and, you know, sort of virtual meeting conferences. Because I think that's the thing. I don't know. 
in my um, sort of viewpoint, it seems like right now a lot of folks, you know, like maybe Comotion team, for example, they're sort of, okay, let's adjust, let's put this event online and sort of, you know, make sure it all runs smoothly. And maybe, you know, during this event, we try a few new things. But I think future online events, I think I'm really kind of eagerly awaiting because I feel like this is like the first iteration of an online conference for a lot of people. And I can only imagine, you know, it's going to get a lot better once people actually start developing products for like a completely online conference. Yeah, without you know, getting too boring in the weeds. Yeah, there already are some really fascinating tools. Um, mm. One of them is called Miro, where it's, you know, it almost combines, you know, the sort of FaceTime Google Hangouts with whiteboarding and kind yeah. of virtual sticky notes. So there's there's cool things you can do when, when everyone just got a screen in front of them. You don't have to worry about walking up to the whiteboard and being embarrassed because your handwriting's terrible. <laughs> nice, very cool. Um, yeah, so really appreciate uh, all the info you shared. I think we kind of talked about, is there any other logistics or details that you want to share about the conference? Um, I think we mentioned sort of, you know, maybe wh where can people go if they want to sign up for the conference, register, anything else they should know, any panels that you want to tease? I know there's a good panel on the curb. Um, anything else you want to talk about? Yeah, a great panel on the curb. Um, <laughs> another one called um, Reimagining Urban Mobility for a Changed World. I think that one's going to be a really kind of fascinating conversation. Touches mm -hmm. on a lot of the things we just discussed. Do you know who's on uh, that panel? Uh, I'll, I'll have to double check on that one for you. I, I haven't fine. yet memorized the whole maybe thing. Maybe we could give a, a quick free preview if, if available. Uh, no worries. Okay, well, if not. I know uh, I'll we'll be on the curb panel, so that's why I mentioned that one. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's why it's going to be the best panel, Harry. Um, I don't know about the best, but it will be one of the panels. Um, yeah, you know, so like a, an opening fireside chat with uh, you know, Miami Dade Mayor Carlos Jimenez. That should be mm. a great one. Yeah, definitely. Um, I know, but I, I would just encourage people, you know, www.commotionmiami.com. Okay. Uh, again, most of it's complimentary. So please sign up and check out the program for yourself. Uh, everyone's got different tastes and I think everyone's going to find something they like. Yeah. Awesome. Very cool. Well, Jonah, I appreciate you coming on and uh, talking all about commotion, what's going on in the world of mobility, how people, conferences, and companies are adjusting. And I'll look forward to seeing you, uh, I guess not in person, but seeing you digitally at uh, Commotion Miami. Yeah, looking forward to it too. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care.